tonight, given that it's uh, the last game of the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> what time does the game start? Is it 7? Eight. 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 Oh, so you'll I'm originally from Wisconsin. Um, I went to the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, which you're probably not familiar with, this right in the middle of the state, uh, for her, my degree in natural resources, uh, for my bachelor's degree. And then I was on the workforce for about maybe six or seven years before I decided to go back to grad school because I, I wanted to work for the Department of Natural Resources, which is kind of like the DC and our peer. Um, that I was competing with hundreds and hundreds of other biologists in line for the same position. So I decided to go back for my master's degree and hopefully it would give me a competitive edge in that capacity. Um, so when I, well, I should point out, when I first applied to grad school, I was actually rejected. I had a 3.2 as an undergrad, and it was uh, too risky for you. You probably won't be successful. Um, but I happened to know one of the faculty members there, so I talked to him and he suggested taking his invertebrate zoology course first to see how I did. So I took his course um, and ended up getting an A. He went to the committee on my behalf, appealed it to let me in. Um, and so I started my career uh, in graduate school probably six or seven years after I graduated. And I was married at the time as well. And, I, and my wife was pregnant, so I had to go and tell her I was quitting my job, going to grad school. Um, so when I entered grad school, they gave me an opportunity to be a teaching assistant. Uh, it was really scared the hell out of me because I'd never taught before. And the course that they gave me was uh, anatomy, well, anatomy lab. Um, I never had an anatomy lab either. So I had to come over everything as I went. But once I started teaching it, for me it was an epiphany. It clicked. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to teach. Um, I didn't want to teach high school because I didn't want to have somebody like me um, in high school. So I wanted to go on for a uh, PhD in eventually teach at the university, which is what I did. Um, and I, I tell my students that you know, I was re rejected originally because of having a 3.2 GPA. When I came out of grad school, my GPA was like 398. Um, so I said, well, why the difference? You know? um, and also, when I was in grad school, or when I was in undergrad, rather, the drinking game was 18. As a bartender for my last two years, I had a blast. <laughs> it really did help with GPA. Um, but I tried to impress upon me the fact that you know, I always thought I was just a, um, an average student, you know, a pre criminal student. But when I went to grad school, of course, it looked very difficult, and I had all these experiences, a couple of minuses. So I tried to impress upon me that, you know, I had that capability all along, as they do, it was maturity. You know, I had other things going on, and uh, they had an annoyance. So, you know, I tell my students when they come in that, you know, you can all get A's and B's, so you have to really define yourself. And hopefully they, you know, take that to heart. So anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I've been doing for the past probably 30 years or so. We go into a lot of detail, but I work with a new group of algae. Um, they're called mixotropes. Let's see, is it, is it the top one? Which are the bacteria, 
Um, and then there's a eukaryote, which are broken down to and fungi. And then plants and animals. You know, and plants are given a category because they're, they're autotrophic or phototrophic. They take sunlight, and CO2 and water, and they convert it into sugars, which they then consume. And then there's the animals um, that are heterotrophic or phagotrophic, and if you're not familiar with that term, is that they basically eat things. You know, organisms that eat other organisms are phagotrophs. You know, we're phagotrophs. Uh, and so they're separated. And the same thing in textbooks. You have animals, and you have plants that are separated. You know, always thought it would be really interesting to teach a biology course. And, and teach it by function, talk about reproduction between plants and animals and how they obtain nutrition from plants and animals because there's more actually similarities um, and differences between us. But if evolution um, teaches us anything, there's always exceptions to the rule. And you're probably familiar with these guys. These are carnivorous plants. Um, these are pitcher plants in, in Sunday. And what happens in pitcher plants is insects fly into this. Plant, and I should point out these plants are found generally in environments that are devoid or low in nitrogen. So they evolve a mechanism uh, to extract nutrients, nutrients from insects. Insects enter this, enter this plant and become trapped, they fall into the bottom where there's some liquid that contains digestive enzymes that breaks down the insects and they consume those nutrients. So they're supplementing their nutrition with animals, with insects. And the same thing with sponges, they become trapped, you know, these little droplets, um, and it dies and they digest it. So you have a, a plant rather that has this animal-like characteristic and that it's consuming other things. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. I'm a seventh grade life science teacher and I do have students ask me this. Now I always answered that without without fact checking, but a pitcher plant is green, so it does it is able to carry on photosynthesis on its own and right. then they it's are. supplemental. Now I, is the sun do green as well? Yeah. Okay. All right. Leaves. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Right. So they're actually, that's a good segue to the, in the conversation because if you combine both autotrophy and heterotrophy, the term for that is, is mixotrophy. And those are the type of organisms that I work with. They're, they're mixotrophic analogy. This is a, a beautiful little sea slug uh, that's found in the ocean called Alicia. When we first found this thing, we said, you know, what a beautiful animal. Uh, it has a nice green pigment. Uh, but upon closer examination, what they discovered was the pigment were actually chloroplasts. Um, it actually ingests this Lacharia, which is a uh, green algae that's found in the ocean. In the process of consuming this algae, it extracts the chloroplasts, um, which are distributed within the animal tissue itself, and those chloroplasts for a period of time are active. So they're photosynthesizing inside this animal, producing sugars which are shared with this sea slug. It's a really unusual um, type of symbiosis. Well, it's not really a symbiosis because it's not an intact cell. And so they're, they're retaining it, so rather just a chloroplast. Um, this was kind of a first indication of a animal has plant-like characteristics because in essence it's photosynthesizing. Um, my interest was peaked um, when I came across this article in Science. Science is the premier biology journal. And this was a study done back in 1986, rather. Um, this is no green. It's a, a Christ white algae that's found everywhere. It's found in lakes in this area. And in the process of doing the study, these two individuals are looking at the grazing rate of animals in this lake, looking at zooplankton, by feeding small bees. And what they discovered was that this plant, this algae, denobrin, can also ingest these bees. So the reddish area here are chloroplasts, uh, and this yellow um, right here is actually a little fluorescent bee that they fed, um, but they added to the water column to see what was ingesting it. And what they discovered was that these algae were the primary consumers of, of bacteria in this lake. It wasn't animals, it wasn't zooplankton. Um, it was really an amazing finding that the algae had a greater impact on bacterial consumption than the small zooplankton in the lakes. And so algae that combine both phototrophy or autotrophy in photosynthesis and phagotrophy in this case of just are called mixotrophs. And that's uh, what I've been working on for the past few years. Um, this is a, a paper that came out a while ago. What they used to do was to take, again, phagotrophs, the, the animals that ingest things, and phototrophs, and they basically separated them because of those two different functional um, responses. Um, but then when they began to look more closely, it turned out that it's much more um, complex than that, that those that are phagotrophic, many can also do photosynthesis, and those that are primarily photosynthesis or photosynthetic, in many cases, can also ingest things. So it turns out that there are many, many, many algae out there 
uh, in both freshwater lakes and in uh, marine systems that are phagotrophic that can ingest things. And the only reason it wasn't seen before is that it was never looked for. Um, and as it turns out, there's a range in this trophy as well. Um, these are price spikes, it's a group of impressive parts of gold and brown algae uh, that I work with. Um, and if you start at the top, the sick prototropic malamonas, those are photos that are the plants for biology. That's all they do is photosynthesize. At the bottom, circlanotropes, these are used to be algae, many of them have lost the capability um, of photosynthesis. Um, if you look at the note right here, obligate phototrophy and faculty of phagotrophy, that's a mouthful. What that means is these are primarily algae, but they have, they can ingest things that have really, really, really low rates. So perhaps they can ingest one bacteria per hour per flagellum. And then you have the obligate phototrophs and obligate phagotrophs. These are um, probably the rare type. They, they have an obligate requirement for both. Meaning that they have, they have to grow in sunlight in order to survive, but they have to be fed food as well. Right? If you take one or the other way, they can't survive when you die. And then the facultative phototrophs, the facultative phagotrophs, this is the group that I primarily work with. These actually, even though they're algae, they grow better as animals. You can grow them in the dark. They have a higher growth rate growing in the dark if you give them food than they do in the light. Um, so there's an there's a immense range in other um, in, uh, types of mesotrophy um, as well as most. So just some examples. Um, Paramecium, you're probably familiar with. This is Paramecium mercerium. It's found in all local ponds and lakes in this area. Um, and when you find it, it looks like this. Uh, these are endosymbiotic chlorella. Um, again, it's, um, Paramecium is an animal. But when you find it, it looks like it has chloroplasts in it. Uh, these aren't. This is actually green algae. And in, when it's, and it's in an environment, it's ingesting algae as food source. That they can discriminate between chlorella, which is a green algae, and other types of algae, and the coil that it retains. Right? And it's actually within the tissues itself. Um, and they're photosynthetic. So they're producing sugars. Some of the sugars they're sharing with this animal. Now, if you grow in the dark, right, the chlorella dies, right, because it's an algae. But it does perfectly fine as long as you give it additional food. Right? So it's a really loose symbiosis. Um, but nonetheless, it's. Uh, yeah, we always find these things, full of chlorella. And the surprising thing is that they can discriminate to what's a chlorella and what's another type of algae. So this is again a this would be a photosynthetic animal. Um, this is an Indian, this is found in um, the oceans. Um, it has cryptomonas is another type of algae that's found on the side. That's these orange areas here. Um, we um, illuminate them with blue lights. This is now, even though it's a photosynthetic animal, this is an oligate phototroph. This was an animal. Um, these things will not leave this animal. Now, this animal has an oligate requirement for life. It can no longer grow in the dark. It's a really tightly ingrained type of symbiosis um, that you can no longer separate the two. So these are basically functioning as chloroplasts now inside that, um, inside that cylinder. So, uh, type of chromosome. Um, and then this is uh, from Vivian Urine, another uh, small silica that's found um, locally. And it uh, practices leptoplasticity, um, similar to what <coughs> it does. It ingests algae, um, and in the process of digesting that, that, that uh, the cell, it keeps the chloroplasts, it digests everything else. So these are all functional chloroplasts that came from um, algae that were ingested. Now, chloroplasts can't survive on their own outside the cell, so they have to be replenished. Um, inside the cell will last maybe a couple hours to a couple of days if not replenished and actually they're going to die off. Um, but it's a really unique strategy because again they're supplementing their nutrition um, with, photos with photosynthesis because of the chloroplasts that they retain from the algae that were ingested. Um, and again this is when I first started uh, working with these organisms back in the 70s, probably in the mid 80s, we thought it was relatively unique. Um, they turned out to be very ubiquitous of how they were. This is open warming. This is an organism I worked with um, for my master's in the PhD. Um, it's a, again, a Christoid algae, a single cell. And I should point out that it has a long flagella in it. But the flagella has what are called um, a stigonine or tripartite hair. So the longer flagellum is hairy, 
normally if you have an organism that has flagellum and beats it, it'll push it through the water column. But the flagellum is hairy when it beats it, it actually pulls it through the water column. Right? But let's say if this attaches to a surface, which it can, and it beats the flagella, it actually creates a water current that pulls the water towards the organism. Right? So it actually does, it pulls food towards the organism, which it can ingest. Um, Good enough. Uh, so this is a phagotrophic analogy. So the question is, you know, you know which came first, photosynthesis or phagotrophic? So was this an algal cell that over time became phagotrophic, or was it a uh, phagotrophic protist that over time became photosynthetic? And it turns out that the, the more ancient form is phagotrophy. And I don't know if you're familiar with the serial endosymbiotic theory. We talked about that in class at all. That was Lynn Marvin. This was one of the um, premier biologists on the planet um, until she died a couple years ago. And she um, spearheaded this theory that the mitochondria and the chloroplast, the mitochondria is in all of us, uh, in all animals, and the chloroplasts are found in all plants, and also paper bacteria, and were bacteria at one time. And when she first tried to publish this back in the 80s, and they said, no, you know, it's too controversial, you know. And in part because she was a female, so that actually she you know, was very sexist. You know. And it turns out she was uh, one of the, <coughs> the, the mitochondria we have in us. Uh, we're bacteria that one time do back billions and billions of years. Um, so eventually what happened is this was a bacterial protist ingested a cyanobacterium, which is a photosynthetic bacterium. Over time, those evolved into chloroplasts. Um, again, I talk to students about this all the time because that was a huge finding back in the 80s and 90s. And this is a lot about who we are as well. You know, not only are we covered with bacteria in us and on us, part of our immune core, but our mitochondria uh, has DNA. And it's you know, certainly DNA just like bacteria. There's a lot of evidence that supports this, is, if not one of that. Um, so this is, again, a, a biology that has a really, really fast growth rate if you feed it bacteria, or as much faster as an algae than it does as the plant uh, um, okay, so group that I work with and, and to show that there's a lot of algae. This is the, the brief list. There's a, a lot of biology out there that has the characteristic of being able to um, ingest the bacteria. They're also cannibalists that have a tendency to, to ingest themselves or each other as well. You probably want to increase all this cartoon. Did you know that I uh, figured some algae loosely and so I talk to my um, siblings the same thing. So who cares you know, that these things are, are bacterial? Um, it's those individuals who are just in the aquatic ecosystem, just like anybody else who works in the terrestrial ecosystem. You're studying white tail deer, for instance. You look at, you know, what's, what preys upon white tail deer, what do they eat, uh, under what conditions um, do they uh, survive. And so, if you go back to this traditional uh, grazing chain, this is how we thought lakes functioned going back maybe 20, 30 years. So, algae at the base of Cuba, ingested by zooplankton. Uh, which are just a fish, a relatively short uh, chain. But that was discovered, quite by accident, that these algae really aren't very efficient. About 30% of the carbon that they produce via photosynthesis leaks out of the cell into the surrounding marsh. Um, so they're not very really efficient. So the question was, well, what, what happens to all this carbon that um, leaks out of these algae? Um, this was this organic matter. It turns out it's taken by bacteria. That they're ever, the smaller you are in the aquatic system, if you're around, you have a higher surface of volume ratio, more competitive. So the majority of the photosynthesis that's being leaked out is taken up by bacteria. So the question is, you know, what happens to the bacteria? They're too small to be eaten by these guys. Right? What happens is they're ingested by flagellates, which are much smaller than zooplankton. The flagellates, in turn, are ingested by ciliates. Um, and then back to zooplankton. This is called microbial boom. So this is how the organic matter that leaks out of algae eventually gets back into this microbial food chain. And then along comes the mixotrophs, which really complicates things. You have the phagotrophic algae down here, which you know, the two bacteria also contribute to primary reproduction, which is photosynthesis, and you have the photosynthetic host at the top, um, which also contribute to primary reproduction because of the ants. So, uh, what are consuming things? So, how the case the picture and the how these aquatic systems uh, work. So, some work that I've done, um, this is a um, Christ algae 
uh, collector, but this is actually a very good tool if you have any interest in doing shit faster. That's a um, plankton net at the top that I'm holding. Um, you can buy really large ones that you can put behind a boat. This is relatively small um, and it has a mesh of about 10 micrometers. Um, so you actually pull this through a water column and the water passes through the side, it affects the water, and there's a little valley open up. So it's a way of concentrating algae um, and zooplankton um, from a lake sample. Moving back um, to the classroom. So this organism, the Crestolophomonas, back about a year ago, uh, with a couple of papers, um, they stated it was a strict phototrope, meaning it's an algae, that's all it does. Um, but it looks a, looks a lot like Ophomonas, so I'm going to pique my interest. Again, I don't want to bore you with all of this. This is some of the um, characteristics of it. Uh, it produces cysts, like the algae do. It also has some scales that you really can't see unless you use a electron microscope. I was interested in its um, capability for phagotrophy. So one way of testing that is to add these small beads. Right. So this is the one in here. You can see the beads inside of it coming around so it indicates that it, it can ingest um, small particles. <coughs> so, um, yeah, but in order to see this, unfortunately, you need a specialized microscope called a fluorescence microscope, though. For these beads will fluoresce if they use blue light excitation or you can be depending upon the beads that you use, they have to use a specialized microscope. Um, and then that is relatively cheap. You can probably get it for maybe 7,000. Um, but if you want to look at things at the cellular level, you know, they have stains that stain DNA, they have stains that stain proteins, um, and then use a fluorescent microscope because the light actually comes from the top. Um, it's a stress and then causes it to fluoresce and then the image goes back up. In cells or DNA in cells. This is for you a really nice device to have, albeit a little pricey. And this is some photographs I took of the same organism in the process of ingesting bacteria. At the top, you can see from the bottom with the flagellum and it's pulling your particle and it's attached to the surface, it's feeding flagellum and it has these tripartite hair cells creating a current coming towards it. You can see it actually grabs on the particle here. This is an evagination of a cell member. It's kind of like a mouth. It comes around, surrounds it, pulls it into the cell, and it's like, and it adjusts it. And that's the process by which many of these algae do that. And you can actually see like the four cluster as well. So it's kind of an unusual mechanism. It's very efficient uh, for that. Do they know, like, how do they sense that the bacteria is there? They run into them by chance? Are there chemicals given off that they sense um, where there's That's a really good bacteria. question. You know, I don't know. And whether they can even taste these things. There's some, there's some data that suggests they can taste things because some of these will capture something and then reject it. But even when they're beating it, anything that comes in that's an appropriate size, they're going to grab it. And then there seems to be some sense capability going on. They'll either let it go or they'll ingest it. Um, one question you can ask is, if it ingests bacteria, you know, how significant is that as a food source? What will be the ingestion rate? So again, you add beads uh, to um, some a water column containing the organism, and take samples over a period of time, count the number of flagellates that have beads in them, those that don't. You get a lot of looks like this, and in this case, we have tomatoes about less than one bacteria per flagellate per hour. So this is, again, not an a algae that eats a lot of bacteria. It has a, a pretty minimal ingestion rate. And it's somewhat controversial whether to use the fluorescent, or you can actually take bacteria you can, you can actually um, stain them with the fluorescent dye as well. And if you look in the literature, there's, you know, there's indication that they will discriminate it against beads as well as FL beads, or sometimes they prefer beads, so it's not really, um, it's still a kind of a political issue. But it's the best way to determine if they're actually ingesting things because you can see them inside of the cell. So again, this is a, a flagellate that does not have a large. So since you're saying that they've taken such a small amount of bacteria per hour, could you then say they're basically like they're mostly a photosynthetic organism? Yeah. And this is just something to do, like not to do, but something that um, in case maybe they don't have enough stored energy. Okay, it's a good segment to one of my slides. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully that'll answer the question. Um, no, this is the next one. Um, so how would you compare their phototrophic growth rate growing as a plant to when you feed the bacteria? And so just, you get replicate 
cultures, add some bacteria, and measure the growth rate. So this is the growth rate in the growing as an algae. And again, just look at the development time. This is 36 hours, but we're about every 36 hours, the cell divides in two. You get a bacteria, it increases to 26 hours. Right? So when you feed the bacteria, they have a higher growth rate than they do if they were growing as a plant. It goes question here is can they use bacteria as a source of nitrogen and phosphorus? Right? Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in, in lakes. And so what you do is you put them in a closer that there is no nitrogen and phosphorus, give them a small amount of bacteria, and again measure the growth rate. You see there's very little growth here because there's no nitrogen and phosphorus, but a dramatic increase here. So they're basically using bacteria as a source for mineral nutrients, not really for carbon. Right? They're primarily photosynthetic, so they're producing their own. Based this organism in the sphere. Okay. And then you can measure the growth rate um, over time I mean, at, relative to bacterial concentration. Um, so you can increase the bacterial concentration. What is the threshold where their um, growth rate is the maximum? So if you put it up right here, about eight, this is about 8 million bacteria per ml, um, the growth rate levels off. Again, they're um, relatively bacterial. And that's the kind of functional response curve that uh, can be generated. And again, we use pseudomonas here as a, as a bacterial for the cells. Um, and are they nutritionally diverse? I mean, can they eat something other than bacteria? I put them a small green alga, um, which is the right there. And it's invisible. I didn't like it. So, whether or not it didn't have the appropriate enzymes to break it down, uh, or whether I don't think the algae was toxic, per se, it's not even known to be. Um, or it's slightly larger than bacteria, but for whatever reason, uh, it grows better on bacteria than um, algae. So there seems to be some discrimination that occurs uh, when feeding. And this is a different organism, Pterichomonas. And I was interested in, in what effect does growth on bacteria have on their chlorophyll content inside the cell? So when they were growing massively, this is uh, one of the algae that grows better as an animal than a plant. So when you're growing it in the light, in the dark, on bacteria, this is the cell-specific chlorophyllase. It's pentagrams, which is 10 to minus 15. So this is the amount of chlorophyll in the cell drop dramatically. The chlorophyll, full chlorophyll in the population stay the same. So what was happening is they were growing so rapidly that they were diluting up the chlorophyll in the cell. And at this point here, if you look at them under the microscope, they would appear to be heterotrophic. You don't see any green at all, because they diluted it out, which is a good strategy because to maintain this plastic is costly. And if they're growing in bacteria, they don't need it. But as soon as they run out of bacteria, they start synthesizing it again in the blood and then some of them in the dark. So it's a really a smart strategy for us all all of us to get like, the chlorophyll of this food into the regenerated what you need. Um, are you doing a black work sanctuary? Yeah, if you aren't, uh, it's a great place to take your class. It's, uh, Director of Education there. Um, I do a lot of my research up there. It's at the Butts Lake Wall and Fall Pack, and they welcome uh, groups um, from middle schools and high schools all the time. It's called the arrangements. It's about a three or four minute drive from here. Um, but um, this is what it looks like in the rural view. It's a, the property itself is about 500 acres. Um, this is about a 50 acre lake. Um, it's the most pristine glaciated lake, um, the most southern glaciated lake in the, in the U.S. Beautiful place to go. So I was interested um, in a cilia called Proodon in the upper right hand corner. Um, so I was interested in this distribution in this lake. Um, and so what I want to do is collect some water samples, but take a vertical profile like every meter uh, down to the bottom. In order to do that, use a van over model, something that's easily accessible. And yeah, there's two plungers on either side. You load to the water column and you send down a metal messenger down the line. Here's the mechanism causing the plungers to release and it captures a water sample. You pull it to the surface, then you can use this um, dissolved oxygen and temperature meter to take a, a beat. You just turn vertically, take one of the plungers off, insert the probe, and you can get the reading. Um, and also, you can use a, a light sensor to get a vertical profile. So, this is the data that was collected. So, at the top is dissolved oxygen, um, starting about 9 milligrams per meter. You see there's a little peak that occurs at about five or six meters, that was due to an album bloom with Gagnastimum. Um, and then it decreases dramatically towards the bottom. 
what's happening in the body is bacteria is decomposing dead plants and organisms. There's no photosynthesis on there, so it almost goes anoxic. Um, this is the temperature profile. If you've ever been in a lake and you dive down deep in the water, it's really cold, really fast. That's a thermocline. It's found in all lakes in this area. So right here is a dramatic change in temperature. Basically forms a physical barrier between the bottom and the top, and this is a decrease um, in um, the light level. So close to the bottom is very little light. This is only 12 meters deep. That's not a very deep light. So these are some instruments you can use to generate this type of um, profile. It's relatively inexpensive, and it's also interested in the organism. So again, if you use the same Van Dorn bottom plectin water sample. You put it in these volumetric flats. This contains this 100 ml of water. You have a little bit of formalin. Um, some uh, Lugol's iodine, which basically causes it uh, to be a little heavier than normal. And then the sodium disulfate. And you basically settle out the bottom. And you siphon off the top 70 or 80 um, mLs. And then it's really blurry. And then you transfer them to really small cellular discs, or um, minimal chambers. And then you put them on uh, an inverted microscope. And then, and because everything settles to the bottom, and under a microscope, the injector lens are on the bottom looking up. And you see images like this. So you're basically seeing you know, what's settled up in the column. It's a way of concentrating it. Um, and then what you just do is you scan the entire surface. And this is what I found. So this is Carbondon, nothing, about six meters, a huge peak at eight, and then goes back in at uh, 12. And Look at it and say, well, you know, it's not terribly exciting. And there's a big peak down there. But what is exciting, or is it something rather, uh, is this. If you compare uh, their depth profile to what's happening physically, again, at 80 meters of peak the dissolved oxygen is at one milligram per liter. There's virtually no oxygen down there. If this is an animal, you know, what, what is it subsisting on? And I would venture that the chlorella that are growing inside of it are producing oxygen for that animal. So it's the chlorella that are giving it oxygen to be at that depth. Um, and but look at the light. It's six microeinsteins. At the top of the surface, it's about 1,200. Uh, very little light down there. And so these must be shade adapted for a as well. But it's a really weird place for these cells to be, for these mixotrophs. Um, and there's also a lot of hydrogen sulfide gas down there, which is toxic. So there may be some sulfur oxidizing bacteria that are also growing in cilia that are able to use that as an energy source. And this is as far as I've gotten in this project, and it's really exciting to find an example of what you're doing down there. And it's the chlorella inside of it that's providing oxygen for it to survive. And this is cartoon. It just sent to me yesterday by chance a friend of mine, Latin Rack, who's the director, and she works in the strokes and there's a you can open one swimming around and it's a bacteria say, watch out, and you say, keep cool, it's pigmented. You know, it's an algae, it's nothing to be afraid of. And they all get ingested, it comes back again, and it's, he's coming, shut up, he's pigmented, he should be safe, but they're you know, scarfing him up. <laughs> I don't know where she got that. <laughs> so if we were misotropic, um, we could look something like this. If you're setting up for lunch and you're having a salad, um, and the, the lettuce is going into your intestines, and the chloroplasts are being separated from that plant. It's um, diffusing through the intestinal wall into your tissues um, and just below the surface. And then, if you go to lunch and if you've got your lunch money, you can just bask in the sun and you produce your own sugars. That not going to happen. And that's my two grandchildren. <laughs> For any questions, if we have time, or um, we'll talk about it later. I actually brought some of the equipment that I've used up here um, in the work that I do. It's not nothing terribly high tech. Yeah, you know, most, but ninety percent of my time, I'm at the microscope, um, which is good and bad, I guess. But, uh, if you have any questions, we are going to help you with. Um, I appreciate being here. Thank you. Thank you.